Welcome back to That Rugby Podcast, hosted by The Rugby Booth. It's my boy, Husey, and myself back again uh, another week. Hello. Look, we've got some international rugby um, mm -hmm. on the horizon and just happened. Um, my All Blacks came up against your Eddie Jones and Japan. <laughs> no, no we, don't, we do not claim him anymore. <laughs> he's, he's still Australian. He's still Australian, so I can still still chuck that one out there. Um, in which was a interesting fixture, um, purely mm -hmm. because two years ago, we had played Japan um, in, the, in the lead up to a World Cup and the lead up to a automation series very similar to this one. Um, and that result in 2022 was 38-31 as Japan came storming back in the closest result Japan's ever got to New Zealand. Now I say this because Eddie Jones made a statement in the lead up to this game. And that statement, as he does, as, 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 he, does, as he does, as he guaranteed a win or the Wallabies over the Welsh in the World Cup only get to beat them by 40 uh, points. He goes, that's what I've been preparing for, and I feel the players are ready to play the best game that Japan's ever played against New Zealand. That's the opportunity ahead of them. Final score, 64-17. So, look, um, when we look at it... Just, 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 to, just to be totally clear here, this wasn't the best game that Japan's ever played against New Zealand. Just, for, <laughs> just in case anyone didn't pick up on that, this was, was not the best game Japan has ever played against New Zealand. And not not even remotely close, you know, from seven points yeah. to uh, you know forty seven points uh, difference. You can tell Eddie's still working on some things, but still making some pretty outrageous mm. statements in the media, which is, I guess, it is what Eddie's been doing for the past few years. And as as we saw with the Wallabies, uh, <laughs> again, I as you talk to more and more people, which is tarnishing his legacy at this point. Again, yeah. <laughs> there, there's there's no belief of mine that maybe he might have this Japan team on a path. And that that path may be the 2027 World Cup, and he may be leading towards something then. But to be saying stuff like that, like again, you can say that inside into your own team and go, let's do this. This is what we want to yeah. achieve. You put it out in public, and then this happens. And again, I'm all for backing your own players and backing your team. But then the results don't come and don't even look like coming. Like I know they were in the game. Yeah after 15, 20 minutes, but it's an 80-minute game rugby. And to deliver that performance, I just go, Eddie, what are we doing? Yeah, and I think as well, like, it actually takes away a little bit the backing your own place in when it is such a lopsided result. You know, I think if it was a close result, then it's good. But look, when you get blown out like that, you know, as a player, you feel like then that you've let down your coach. You feel like that they're probably going into the game that there was this huge expectation on you as well. Like, just thinking, you know, maybe they, they have different mindsets. I'm just thinking about where my mindset would be going into this game. You know, going up against the All Blacks, you know, a powerhouse of, of rugby. Um, and for my coach to go out there and say, yep, this team is going to uh, have the best performance they've ever had against New Zealand. Like, I think once the, the, the tries started falling against them, that's, I think probably a little bit of that downward spiral, a little bit of that tilt came into there, and that was probably influenced by the coach's words as well. Just not a great look for, for anyone, really. Uh, I, yeah, I think that, you know, I think the... the, the I always admire uh, Mike Tomlin of the, the Pittsburgh Steelers because he, he has mastered the art of saying a lot with saying very little. Um, in another life, I think he would have been a really good lawyer. Uh, He's just, you know, he, he publicly backs his players without putting guarantees and expectations and statements that everyone could say, oh, well, Tomlin guaranteed this or he said that this would happen or this, this and this. But he he G's up his players. He gets them ready for the game, so on and so forth. And I think Eddie needs to take a page out of the, that book instead of saying a oh, guaranteed win or you know, guaranteed this is going to be the best performance um, New Zealand's ever had against the All Blacks. Moderate your language a little bit. Just so you know, we've been trailing really hard and we have high expectations for ourselves for this game. Great. <laughs> you know, incorporate a bit more of that corporate speak into your game. You know, I think he needs to do a crash course at uh, Deloitte or PwC or one of the big four and just, you know, learn learn how to write an email which will get you paid but in which you do nothing. Um, and I think that'll that is really surfing for his press conferences very well. Um, to 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 you know, just just He's a bit too far on the one side. He needs to dial it back a little bit. But, I mean, that's that's Eddie Jones. I don't think he'll ever dial it back. Um, that's part of what makes him a unique character of the game. Yeah, totally. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I, I don't think some media training or refreshing wouldn't go and miss the good old Eddie. No. Um, look, I just wanted to discuss quickly about the good because there was a lot of good that came out of the All Blacks. 
debutants with um, Peter Larkai and Ruben Love. Interesting enough, both Hurricanes and Wellington Lions players. Pretty damn good day to be a Wellington and Hurricane <laughs> fan. Um, so those boys went on. Um, Love two tries. Larkai doesn't look like he misses much. Um, will miss much when playing at that level. Um, then we go on to Patrick Toy Polotu, who was uh, captaining the side for the first time in his career and had one of the better tries you'll see from a lock um, running over a few players down the sideline. Um, and then what I really loved, we we tested out something in this game. Was we had our heaviest full pack, I think, ever, um, with over like 940 kilos, I think it was, something like that, for the whole full pack. So it was the biggest full pack we've had. Obviously, we started a bit slow, but worked our way into the game and just... How that will translate again? We our competition at the moment isn't Japan, obviously. Like our competition, who are we looking at? Like South Africa. On if we want to be a, on an even playing field with South Africa, what are South Africa doing? Well, well, they create these monsters. They don't eat salads. They win scrums. So that's what South yep. Africa are doing. So how can we best combat that? Is it this massive four pack? Well, they delivered on this game. Um, I'll be interested to see how. Razor goes selecting players forward now. Obviously, our next matchup yeah. is England, which we'll touch base on later. How that squad looks, but I was very impressed with this sizable four pack and how they delivered. You know, without the Artie Savers as well in there as well. A um, couple of other names: Wallace Atiti moved back to eight, didn't look out of um, place there. Um, Finau as well. Chiefs who kind of been put to the side a little bit because of how well satiti has been playing at six. Went out there and monstered another ten and seems to love it. And again, it's that. If we're going to be competing against the, the, the South Africans, if we want to beat the South Africans, we've got to understand how they play and how can we combat that. And I think Finau's one of those guys yeah. where he's so physical. He's, as we've always said, a, a, a um, Lockie Swinton, bit of a bastard, will do what he needs to do to deliver it for the team yep. and puts his body on the line. So, look, a lot of good came out of it, but we go into kind of next week with England on our minds. Before that, though, as you aren't playing yet, I thought, let's give you some time. Time to shine. Your Wallaby squad has been named. Yes. Give us your rundown. What are you thinking? What's yeah. happening? I love this. So Wallabies and Australia 15 both both dropped, which is really good for all Australian rugby fans. So I think the, the biggest headline, and it has been in the, the news headlines, is is obviously the in, inclusion of Joseph Su Ali. Now, I've responded to a few posts on social media, as in I've commented on posts where where rugby league reporters are calling it a disgrace and it's everything wrong with Australian rugby and it's tarnishing the legacy of the last 25 years of the Wallabies jersey. First of all, referring to the last 25 years in any kind of a positive light really shows you haven't been paying that much attention to rugby union in Australia. Like, uh, you know, it's, it it's, uh, yeah, not, not <laughs> great. Uh, but, at the same time, this has happened so many times before, like, uh, you know, Marika Corbetti uh, and, and other league debutants, but even just younger players making their debuts for the Wallabies ahead of really doing anything massive in Super Rugby is not that uncommon, you know? Um, and considering the next games the Wallabies play after the... Um, after the this tour will be British and Irish Lions game, games you want to get Suwali'i incorporated pretty quickly you want him to get up to speed pretty quickly uh so you know i you know and the same by the same token you don't hear them complaining that Tane Edmund's been included in the squad when he didn't play any of the rugby championship he was over playing in New Zealand so you know it's just you know saying that his first test match is is a tour game i just it's just stupidity it's just rugby league riders looking to make a headline and just shows that they're not, they don't really understand what rugby union is all about. And that's fine. You know, you could just stick to it. But hey, it's great. It's what it has done though. It's been great to see some media attention on the Wallabies for once. Even Channel 9 did a, a report, miraculously a report on Suwili being in the squad. And we saw Alan Alatoa give a very good interview uh, on that as well. Amazing. Great, great. That's what we want. And, you know, it is Hamish McLennan. He, he he said it, and that's one of the things we said last week that, you know, when we talked about his comments, we said that's part of what he said is probably true, where Joseph Suwali has already paid off his contract. Hey, if he can bring this level of media attention, great, amazing. Look, if Nathan Cleary could do that as well, I'd be I'd be for the signing. And that's what I said last time. I said I'd be very aroused by that signing. Um, 
I just don't I don't think it's going to happen. And I think going all out on rugby league plays isn't the way to go. That being said, if you can hook Nathan Cleary, get Nathan Cleary. Um, then the other uh, big inclusions uh, that we didn't see in the rugby championships are Will Skelton and uh, Samu Karevi. Um, and I'll talk about Tane Edmund in a little bit as well. But uh, just focusing on, I guess, the international inclusions, because we really didn't see any uh, during the rugby championship other than Marika, and even then only in limited action. Um, and and Corabetti's not part of this this squad either. Um, so Karevi being in, I think, is great. I think one of the areas of weakness that everyone recognized in the rugby championship was inside centre. And again... I'm not the biggest Hunter Paisami fan on the international stage. Love him at the super rugby level. And I think he's serviceable at the international level. I don't think he is the right fit for the Wallabies or can give them what they need out of there. With the inclusion of Karevi and Suwali, you've got another couple of strong options there as well. And hopefully what that does is it actually helps Paisami improve his game as well. Like learn from them, bounce it, they'll feel that pressure, that competitive pressure to the need to step up. Um, uh, but I think that could be... So those those two will be really strong inclusions. Uh, you could even see Suwali playing outside centre. I think Ikitao is a fantastic outside centre as well, but can you imagine a karevian suwali combination in the centres? That would be um, pretty exciting to watch for Wallabies fans. But Before you go on to Tane Edmund, just quickly, I, I yeah. do want to touch base on that. Where are you playing them now? Now like you've looked at, you've got Karevi and you've got Ikitao as your potential centres who we already know yeah. are a formidable pair. Like I saw a stat like they've won five yeah. of the last seven, last seven games to give it. So do you go try Joseph somewhere else? Look, I think that's a very good question and I'm glad I'm not the one that has to make that decision. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't... You if know, you were to what, make the decision, I guess then. If I was to make the decision, I would play Karevi 12... Iki Tau thirteen. Uh, I would have Peach as one wing, and I would have Suwali the other wing with Kellaway on the bench because Kellaway can can also can be your injury cover because he can play fullback and wing, and then have Wright as your fullback. Because um, I think Kellaway's value is in his utility. I think Suwali has also got value in utility as well. So if you have that combination, let's say so Karevi twelve. Uh, well, you know, for argument's sake, Jake Gordon nine, Edward ten, um, Peach slash Suwili eleven, whatever. Twelve Karevi, thirteen Icky Town, fourteen Peach slash Suwili, fifteen right. Then on the bench you've got Kellaway. Say you get an injury to one of your centers, Suwili slides into center, Kellaway goes in the wing. You get an injury in the wing, Kellaway goes in the wing. Injury at fullback, Kellaway goes to fullback. Or Suwili slides back to fullback, Kellaway goes in the wing. Like it covers you in multiple different angles. That way, is what, and if there's no injuries, Karevi or Suwili, if either of them are like sort of really fatiguing, you pull could pull one of them off and let Kellaway uh, get on there because you know Karevi hasn't played Wallabies rugby in, in a year. So this is Suwili's first union action in quite some time as well. Maybe you don't want them playing the full eighty minutes. So that's personally what I would do. Um, and then uh, you name Tane Edmund there. So let's let's go on to him. So you think he should be yeah. the starting ten? Well, yeah, I think what we we. Uh, what we saw from Noah wasn't enough for him to lock down that 10 jersey. I think Tane Edmund has done a fantastic job in the NPC. I think it's worth him getting a shot leading the side to see what he can do at this point, you know? Like, time is running out for the Wallabies to get ready for the British and Irish Lions tour, right? You sort of know what you have in Noah at this point, and you and so I think what you need to do now is find out what you have in Edmund in Wallabies colours, Against you know some formidable opponents like they're you know they'd be playing world number one Ireland. Uh, there's you know this is not going to be an easy tour for the Wallabies. So uh, I think it's good to find out what you have in against Edmed in Wallabies colours. Um, get him out there, see what he can do, and then if it's just a complete disaster, you can always go back to Noah and realize okay, Noah's going to be our best option at ten. Let's invest in molding this side around what Noah's strengths and weaknesses are and, and build the game plan around him. Conversely, if Edbert has a really good game, you do the opposite. Okay, Edbert is our future at 10. We're going to style the squad around what Edbert can do. I think you just have to find out what you have there. Um, I don't think there's, you know, I think Donaldson is, again, serviceable at 10, but I don't think he is going to set the world on fire. I think he's similar to Paisami in that he's serviceable at an international level, but he shines at super rugby level. And it's fine. There's always players that are going to be like that. And 
they can help you out in a pinch at the international level. But what this Wallaby squad needs more than anything, really, is stability, is knowing their identity, is knowing who their who their uh, um, first stringers are. Who their if everyone is healthy, this is the person for this job. Flat out, that's it. You know, I think they for a long time have lacked that, particularly in the halves, right? And so I think figuring that out is is key for them. So you know, it's not like Edbert hasn't been playing rugby. He's been he has been playing rugby. He's ready to go in that position. I don't think you really need to ease or transition him in, um, like you might need to a Suali, uh, who hasn't played union for a while. I think you could put Edbert in, and he's Edbert is also going to be bringing some ideas that maybe the Wallabies haven't seen for a while. You know, because he's been playing in that NPC tournament, he's been playing New Zealand style rugby. Maybe he could bring some of that to uh, the Wallabies who need a bit more stability and direction. Yeah, love that. And then in the um, obviously the Australian XV, any names that stand out there? Um, obviously, Tom Liner, Liner uh, has headed back to yeah. the XV, which is again, it's not. A, I wouldn't say that's a step backwards. He's still making his name. He's had a good experience in the rugby exactly. championship. Gets another opportunity here. But any other names there that jump out at you? Corey Tool. I mean, uh, I mean, he's on the graphic on Instagram as well. <laughs> uh, but just a, a, a lightning in a bottle type player, like absolute. Uh, magician at super rugby level and we know he's great at rugby sevens as well but can he now execute that at an international level um for a 15-man game australia's spring tour is england wales scotland and ireland you know uh they start their tour on the 10th the australia xv start on the 9th and then have a game on the 18th as well you then have a game against scotland on the 25th right so if Corey Tull absolutely lights it up against bristol and england does he get looking for that scotland game maybe who knows? You know, mm-hmm. like this is his, this is really, he's done absolutely everything asked of him to prove himself for a wall of his jersey. I, I'm very confident he'll do the same here in the uh, Australia XV as well. You know, um, I think he just needs to be given a chance. I think because of his size, I think that puts a bias against him about playing him at that level. But then you see players like Cheslin Colby, just monsters of the uh, international game as well. So, I, th- I think it's probably a bit of conservatism for Australia, but also a bit of a uh, abundance of riches, right? You look at the wingers that the Wallabies played this year, Dalgunu, Korobeti, uh, Kellaway, Jorgensen. Right now you've got Suwali, who might potentially be in the mix as well. Peach, who had a, a, a strong end to the rugby championship. Um, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a very deep position for the Wallabies, which is great because, you know, injuries happen. Injuries happen. He, he just needs an opportunity. Massimo Delutis. <laughs> Now, I don't know if that's a name that you know of. Uh, uh, but I have done some re- reading on him since I saw his name in Select. Is this the, I, I believe this is the one that you were talking about this earlier. This is the who, guy who, 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 who the, made the, the benches 210 kilos or something. 126 kilo prop. Massimo is a very appropriate name <laughs> uh, for him. Only, t- only 20 years old. Uh, here we go. Bench press 202.5 kilos in the gym to eclipse the Reds record set by Wallaby's prop, Taniela Tupo. Right. Love this. As you were talking about with the All Blacks before, a bit of size, a bit of meat on the bone for the props. Love to see. I'd love to see him have have a good game um, and, and, you know, get some more prop depth because that's what we've been talking about for a bit this year is like what is the Wallabies prop depth? Now we've got Tom Lambert and DeLutis here in the um, – in the Australia XV, in the Wallabies, you know, we've got Kailea, who's another young player. Obviously, we've got Tupo and Bell as well. And suddenly now you're starting to see perhaps a bit of depth creeping into the squad foul, which is you know, really positive uh, for uh, for Australia and for the Wallabies. Um, and I guess it's one of, those, that, one of those positions as well, just that is an apt freak from rugby league, if you know what I mean. Like, if you want to mm-hmm. be a prop in rugby union, you're probably not looking at league. Um, because it's just it's not transferable the skill set. So exactly again, it's it's one of those ones that you can latch onto them early, like you've done here. Twenty years old, get them into an Australian yep. XV. It's fantastic work. Hundred percent. And look, it's it's also a position that um, uh, I saw a phrase about this. I think about NFL offensive and defensive linemen, um, where they call them something like. Um, world limited players in that there's only there's there's a very finite number of people on the planet that have the body frame that can actually play the position so you have a very shallow pool to pick from um with these players so being able to get depth in that position is huge um 
Look, one name that I want to highlight going back to the Wallabies now uh, is is probably not really that surprising that a lot of people have latched onto this name. It's Harry Potter, right? <laughs> Western Force player, but obviously the also the boy who lived. Um, look, it's another he's another one of those players, sort of like um, Tane Edbed, who has not gone the traditional way of making his way into the Wallabies side in that in this rugby championship period, he continued playing for the force and had some strong outings in their exhibition games. That's given him a, a look in for the Wallaby squad. You know, he's a, he's a utility player as well. Um, may not get some game time, but I think him being included in the squad is again, a good building of that, that depth. Maybe we see him in one of the later um tests you know maybe against a, a scotland or a wales um you know i think that is is a great story that and i think this is a really valuable lesson for a lot of uh young rugby players um him and tane edwin which is you know just because you don't make the first cut doesn't mean you can't have an impact doesn't mean you can't get your name in there you don't have to wait until next year your year's not over once the super rugby season ends and you don't get picked for the wallabies right go out there find somewhere else to play find something to do you know um and 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 put your hat in the ring force the selectors to take notice of you and that's what these two have done they force them to take notice of them and and now they're in the wallabies where they skip straight past australia xv they've come straight into this wallabies side um so i really wanted to highlight that um uh because i think it's it's uh Tr- tremendous stories to both of them. Totally, yeah. And exciting times for the Wallabies um, as they go yeah. on, on the hunt for a Grand Slam, potentially, um, getting to play the four um, UK nations um, and our Irish and Irish Lions nations. Um, what we have, though, is we have three international games this weekend coming up. Um, obviously, the big one being headlined by England and New Zealand, which we'll touch base soon. We've got Munster versus the New Zealand XV, and then Scotland hosting Fiji. Um, Munster and I would not want to play in that game. <laughs> Fiji. If, if if there's any game that screams forward slugfest, it's Scotland versus Fiji. Yeah, they'll. I, I think it'll be an absolute. I think we'll see like two spectacular tries by the backs. Yeah, the rest of it just absolutely some hard hitting nature. Yeah, um, there's gonna game, be some so. bruised bodies after that. Yeah, and it'll be interesting. Obviously, um, Mick Byrne, former um, Fijian Drula coach, taking over. Um, Fiji led them to the Pacific Nations Cup title over Japan mm. and uh, now going to his first northern tour with them. There's been a lot of talk as well with Fiji in the background, um, potentially being um, bankrupt or not being paid fully the players over their World Cup mm. success. Um, so Moa having the same issue in rugby as well. So those Pacific Nations holding on for kind of dear life. We're good to see if Fiji can put up their hand and put in some good performances here. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Munster and the NZXV. This is a cool expedition game. Again, exact same as you guys play in Bristol, your A team. Um, will be interesting to see how some of those younger players that have been selected in that team go. Uh, but the big one, the one that everyone's been waiting for, obviously, I will be going to this game. It's in London oh. at, at the home of rugby Twickenham, a.k.a. now Allianz Stadium, London. Um, very Great city. stadium. Yeah. Um, so exciting times. There is an aura in the air at the moment of – that this game is happening. Uh, tickets sold out fast, like crazily fast. Like I only just managed to get a couple. Um, and it's one of those games I think every single English person gets up for. Like they, yeah. everyone knows it's the All Blacks coming. Like there's a, obviously there's a, there's this South Africa aura as well at the moment, but I don't think South Africa and England don't have quite the same rivalry. Obviously, we're still in yeah. the Commonwealth, all of that, rah 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 um, South Africans more of Dutch heritage than the English heritage. Whereas the New Zealanders, it's like, you know, they came to our land. This is partially, you know, that's our king as well. And so we go, this is the game we want to win. That's the game that they want to win because they know the All Blacks are the team to beat in world rugby when they put themselves up against the best. So we've got one of the, probably one of the more exciting matchups purely because England came down under and played New Zealand earlier this year in the in the series. We won that 2-0 in two unconvincing wins where England were right in the game. Mm. Now, New Zealand rugby players obviously have been together for a while. We had our rugby championship. Didn't go the way we wanted. Wouldn't have called it a success, as we've mentioned before. We then had this game against Japan. The English team have had started their season. So the club season's well and truly underway, and now they've come into this camp for the Northern Tour Games. 
it is going to be so interesting what we see from these two teams. Borthwick trying to lay down the challenge straight away. Um, the All Blacks, obviously, Razor trying to show that he is the right man for the job still, even though I yeah. think he is. Um, we look at it like this. The last time I believe we played in Twickenham was the 25 all draw. Um where we jumped out to, it was, I think it was 25 free with like 20 minutes ago, and England managed to pull mm. it back. A lot of different faces in English. You know, Owen Farrell, no longer the face of England rugby with his move to uh, France. So there's going to be a lot of storylines written. Who's going to be named? It seems like it's going to be Marcus's Marcus Smith's team. Um, England, for the first time, I believe as well, have done some centralised contracts. I haven't fully read into it, but there's been like 17 players who have had a top up of their contract um, to make sure that they stay in England is the idea because they also cannot select international players. It kind of feels like we're at this point where this is the two teams who, in the world, you know, Ireland, I believe, they can select only from Ireland as well. So they might be there as well, but they've obviously got their centralised contract and the game's flowing there. But mm. where the game's a little bit iffy in the air, but they're still very traditional with the way they play and the way that they run their business. New Zealand still, you have to play in New Zealand to be selected for the All Blacks. England have to play in England to be selected for them. What I'm going to ask you, mate, is who do you think is going to win this? Without knowing the team list, obviously we're shooting um, kind of from the hip yeah. here because we don't know what teams have been selected. We don't know who's available and who's not. But off of vibe, feeling, where are you going? As a Wallabies fan, I hope you absolutely massacre <laughs> because we play them a week after so it'd be good for you to run through them a bit cause a couple of injuries no, no i don't i actually don't want to say that i don't like wishing injury on any player, but you know just get them a bit bruised and battered soften them up for the wallabies so then we can complete the anzac grand slam um of both teams beating england in england um which i think would thus i think that would make it a really uh, just a successful year for the wallabies and all blacks all over if we could combine <laughs> to do that i'd be pretty happy um, for, for us both to, to beat, um, you know, the motherland. Uh, no, I mean, look, my, my instinct is, is New Zealand. Like, yes, you're playing in England and England have had some close results against New Zealand in New Zealand. I think that that was very early on in the All Blacks, you know, regenesis, the regeneration of the talent, the new team. Um, you, you, you had a very strong showing this last week. Yes, it's against Japan and Eddie Jones is Japan, but still like, you can see the team starting to come together a bit more, um, and yeah, I, I think I think New Zealand could take it. I think they can go into England and, and beat England. Um, so I'm I'm you know firing from the hip. My instinct says New Zealand, so I'm going to follow my instinct. Yeah, I love that for you, and I, I you know I may follow suit next week depending on how I see performances that rack up and the teams get named. But I believe. That it is a New Zealand glory to, to, to come here. And again, Twickenham, we, st- we tend to struggle against the English and we tend to struggle in Twickenham. Um, we've had some very famous games in Twickenham. Mm. England bring their best. It's what they do. It's their home. They're standing up. They're standing for the rows. They want to deliver. Yep. But today, right here, right now, as we shoot from the hip, I say they don't deliver. And I think it's going to be a two-try victory, two-try gap. For the All Blacks, yeah. I think it's not going to be convincing to the point of like a 40 to 10, you know, where we've seen from the All Blacks in the past with times when they click. But I think this is going to be a high score. And I still don't think we've correctly sorted out our defensive woes, mm. um, as you saw, 17 points against um, Japan put on. So I kind of go, I think there's about four tries in there for England. I think there is with maybe a penalty. There's maybe three tries with a penalty. We're looking at 24, 27-ish around that score line. So what I'm thinking yeah. is it's going to take 40 points for the All Blacks to win. So I'm thinking about, a, if I'm going to chuck out a score line, a 39-26 score line is what I'm seeing here. I think we're going to, our attacking brilliance is going to be showing and our defensive lapses are still there and that'll happen yeah. and we'll learn from those, those as we go um, but I think I see that how the game pans out if we come back on next Monday and I've predicted that perfectly honestly you're going to you're gonna see something special um, but yeah that's where I see the game going it's probably going to end up as a you know 7-10 game and be the most dull affair um, and we don't see any points but but we'll see. So that's our prediction for the six. England. Three, yeah, nine three to six. Three <laughs> a drop goal. <laughs> a couple yeah, three penalties to a drop goal. Yeah. <laughs> um, last thing for today, uh, as I said earlier, it's a good day to be a Wellingtonian. Good weekend to be a Wellingtonian. Why? You saw Peter Larkai and Ruben Love start for, or play for the All Blacks. How awesome is that? Um, you also saw Wellington 
won one of the best MPC finals in the history of MPC, which is saying a lot because the MPC has been going for a long time now. Um, but a 23-20 game that went into extra time, um, so a 100-minute game in Wellington against Bay Plenty. Bay Plenty haven't won it um, since they've been in the comp for like 48 years. So, Or they've won it once in 48 years. There's 48 years of drought. So Bay Plenty brought everything they've got. Um, to Wellington. Wellington with one of the better teams you'll see on paper. Um, Jackson Garden Bishop. Um, that's all right. I, I grew up playing with him. What am I going to say? Uh, played his 100th game for Wellington, which is awesome as well. Um, a massive shout out there because the last person to do it, crazy stat, 2007. This is, see, this is the difference. You know, we're, we're talking now just about 20 years between 100 games. That player was Tana Umana. The last person to play 100 games to the NPC because of the NPCs radically changing and shifting and Super Rugby growing and NPC declining. It's not seen as such an achievement anymore to play as many games for, the, for, the, for your NPC team. So to play 100 games, Jackson, Jacko, bloody good job. Um, he was at 10. They had Riley Higgins, who's recently been called up to the All Blacks XV. Um, they had Julian Severe on one wing. They, uh, it was a star-studded team. They had Brad Shields in there. You just look around and you, you saw names and um, numbers, and uh, that's what Wellington delivered. Duplicy Karifi, captain, leader, um, gets us gets the job done. So to Wellington, obviously, this is two times in three years, um, trying to win back some of the glory days of the Wellington Lions and take some NPC titles. It's been a bloody good day. And as they say, can't beat Wellington on a good day. It may have been a shit day, though, and we still could, we're still going to beat Wellington. So, big win for my Wellington Lions. All signs are pointing to a Hurricanes in a Super Rugby victory. You don't, I don't doubt it now. Um, if we get the boys from Wellington, get those XV boys back, get the All Blacks back, um, we're not even going to miss Artie Sofia. We're not going to miss him. We're, look, the Lions didn't miss him. The Hurricanes aren't going to miss him. We're going to win it all. It's just... I, look, it's... it's <laughs> I, be- I believe you don't miss Artie when I see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't miss him. He misses me. Um, <laughs> that'll do us today, though. This is um, been episode ninety nine, actually, of that rugby podcast. So, thank you to all those who have been joining us through the ninety nine. Next week will be a hundred, which we've got something slightly special set up for that. But for now, mm-hmm. we will see you same place, same time next week. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye. Peace.